If you're a believer, you'll face trials like alienation, slander, humiliation, and sorrow, things that none of us looks forward to. But they're part of a life of any believer, one who is actively living for God in an increasingly hostile society. Why does that happen? Well, because when we're faithful to God's ways, we make unrepentant sinners uncomfortable. Welcome to the Bible Study Hour, a radio and internet program with Dr. James Boyce, preparing you to think and act biblically. Our message today is all about suffering disgrace for Jesus' sake. We'll learn how to live under the pressures and trials that believers face when they're identified with Christ. We'll examine the early church and how those believers suffered as the gospel spread throughout the land. Let's listen now together to Dr. Boyce. We're well into the fifth chapter of Acts in our study of this important New Testament book and have advanced far enough in our study now that I think we can begin to see something of the pattern of Luke's molding of the material in these early chapters. He has a very simple form that he is following, but it's interesting to note it because it has some significance. What Luke is doing in these early chapters is alternating between a portrait of the church in and of itself, that is, the believers alone in their fellowship, in which he talks about their life, their witness, their joy, and the way they function. He alternates between that type of portrait and a portrait of the church in relation to the world. Let me show you how that operates. In the very first chapter, we have the church alone. Here they are gathered after the ascension of Christ, conducting their own business, electing an apostle to replace Judas, who had betrayed the Lord and then had killed himself. We see the church together, the believers together in their fellowship. In the second chapter, when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, we find the church in relationship to the world. Here, this great event has taken place, and Peter stands up. He's the spokesman on this occasion, and he preaches the first great Christian sermon sermon based on the Old Testament and very much applied to the life and experience of the people of Jerusalem. And then thirdly, at the very end of that chapter with verse 42, Luke goes back to this portrait of the fellowship of the believers. And we see that classic section there that we've talked about at some length, where he describes how the Christians were all together devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. Then in the third chapter and running on into the fourth chapter, about verse 22, you have the church before the world again, the relationship to the world. Now there's a change at this point. The first time Luke has shown the church in relationship to the world. It's a situation of witness only. Pentecost has taken place, and Peter is preaching, and many respond. Those are glorious days. This second time, when he begins to show the church in relationship to the world, he brings in this matter of persecution, opposition that we began to find. We saw as we studied that that the leaders ended by commanding Peter and John and the others not to preach any more in this name. They didn't even want to say Jesus, but that's what they were talking about. No more in this name. So you have opposition developing. And then Luke goes on to show us the church alone again, beginning with 4.23. As he describes how Peter and John went back to the people and reported to them, and we saw how they had a worship service there, how they praised God. We saw something of their prayer at the end of the chapter. We had verses that were almost a repetition of those verses that come at the end of chapter 2. Again, a description of their unity and heart and mind and their sharing and their testimony to the resurrection. But now in the fifth chapter, there's something else. Here you have a portrait of the church alone, the first verses. But now you see it's not 
quite that glorious picture that we had at the end of chapter 2 and the end of chapter 4. Now we have division in the church, hypocrisy, dissension for the first time, and judgment upon the household of God. It's only out of that that we have the portrait of blessing once again that we find at the beginning of our section. So it goes back and forth. Church alone, church in the world. Church alone, church in the world. And we come in this fifth chapter to another portrait of the church in relationship to the world. But here, now, the third time Luke has done this, the opposition that we saw earlier grows into outright persecution. And for the first time in this history, first time in all these five chapters that we've been studying, we find that the apostles are actually abused, actually beaten, physically beaten, because of their witness to Jesus Christ. Now, I say that's significant because it represents two different things that go on in the church. And I would suppose that by this arrangement, Luke is really saying that both things are necessary. Sometimes you have a church that goes so much over on the side of its own fellowship and its own joy and the wonder of gathering together that it loses sight of the fact that it's to be in the world as a witness to Jesus Christ. And so external matters tend to be forgotten or overlooked or abandoned, and the church just loves its fellowship. Why? They just get together, they just have a wonderful time, but they're not thinking of anybody else. And on the other hand, sometimes the church goes the other way. The church says, the liberal church tends to be more like this. Church says, well, we're here to do good works, and so they're out there in the world all the time doing the good works without the base that comes from the unity and fellowship and worship and prayers of the Christian community. And what Luke is saying by this arrangement is that both things are necessary. If you have the one, if you have the outward service without the inner strength, well, pretty soon the service becomes a superficial thing. It becomes essentially no different than the kind of things the world does. Oh, it's good deeds and that type of thing, but without the spiritual vitality that actually produces change, lasting change. On the other hand, You can so focus on your fellowship that you forget the task that's there, and then you become self-centered, and the compassion for others that is supposed to flow in us as a result of having the Holy Spirit within evaporates. The two necessarily go together. Well, with that kind of an introduction, let's look at this chapter, beginning with verse 12. It has a number of sections. The first is this portrait of the church again. They had just gone through this very difficult time with Ananias and Sapphira. God had judged these two for their hypocrisy, for their lying to God. It's interesting, when God strikes people dead, as we find it in the Scripture, it is not unbelievers that He strikes dead. It's those whom, so far as we can tell, were genuine Christian people, but who were sinning doesn't mean, of course, that God isn't going to pronounce judgment upon others as well. There is a final judgment, and those who reject Jesus Christ will be judged at that judgment. But in this life, God apparently passes by much of the evil of this world, but he does take sin among his people seriously. And here at this crucial juncture in the church, God pronounced a terrible judgment upon these two who were sowing dissension through hypocrisy and lies in the midst of the Christian community. Now, what we come to in verse 12 is the renewed and reunified church that came out as a result of that judgment. We're told a number of things about this church. It would seem at this period that God did even more signs and wonders among them through the apostles than had been done previously. There had been miracles earlier. There was that miracle of the healing of the lame man that led to that great sermon of Peter's and Solomon's colonnade in the temple area. But it seems to have been scattered. Now in this paragraph we find a description of a number of things that are being done. We're told something else. We're told that more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So not only were miracles being done, but the gospel was being preached in such force that people were actually believing it in large numbers and were responding, and the church was beginning to grow. Then the third thing that we're told here, and this is a new item, verse 16, crowds gathered also from the towns 
around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and they were healed. This is the first time, you see, in Luke that we are told now that the gospel is beginning to expand beyond Jerusalem into the towns of Judea. What Luke is really telling us, and the book as a whole follows the outline, is that what Jesus had said in the Great Commission that he gives us in the first chapter was being fulfilled. In Acts 1.8, Jesus had said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the world. Now, that's exactly what was happening. The disciples had borne their witness in Jerusalem, and now that gospel was being spread into Judea, all the little towns round about in the tribal territory of Judah. And then, as we're going to see, it spreads in the next chapters to Samaria, and then eventually, and largely through the apostolic ministry of the Apostle Paul, throughout all the Greek cities, and eventually to Rome, which is the point where the book ends. So, we have a time of blessing. The second section of this chapter, this portion of the chapter we're considering, shows that the time of blessing was also accompanied by a time of persecution. As I said, this is the first time that actual physical persecution, abuse for the cause of Christ, came to the disciples. It begins with a picture of the frustration of the Jewish leaders. Now, we've already seen that. Here is a movement that is beginning to spread and spread powerfully among the people, Not just a passing thing, it would seem, but hundreds and then thousands are responding to it. And these men who are in charge of the religious life and also the political life of the nation are very frustrated by what's going on, and quite obviously so. They're frustrated, first of all, because what is happening is happening in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. The very way they speak of that name again and again in these chapters shows how very, very disturbed they were by that. Jesus, after all, was this upstart rabbi in their judgment, this man who had come who knows from where, what kind of ancestry he had, and certainly without any real training, not the kind of training they had in their schools, and he took upon it himself to be a rabbi, that is to teach what the Old Testament really meant, which was their job, and not only that, he did it powerfully, charismatically, winsomely, in such a way that he got this large following, at least at one period of his ministry. And yet, as they looked at him, this this Jesus of Nazareth was a false prophet. He was a blasphemer. He made out that he was God. Oh, he was clever. He was careful not to do it too openly and do it in a way that would cause witnesses to come and make an accusation so they could get rid of him. But that's what he meant. They knew it. And eventually, it was on that charge that they had him condemned in their own court and then by manipulation had him condemned by the Romans and so crucified. I detect as I read these chapters the kind of things they say, the way they react to the name, that although undoubtedly in their minds they would have said, we were right to do what we did, deep in their hearts they were guilty for having done away with what was quite obviously a very righteous man. Even if they weren't going to Acknowledge that he was God. He was certainly a great teacher, and he taught well and winsomely, and he had a loving character, and they had done him in. So a lot of their frustration, you see, came from that. They thought that at least that finally they had got rid of him. And now here are all his apostles, his disciples, preaching in that name. And then secondly, they were frustrated by the fact that this preaching of the name of Jesus involved the resurrection. This is a point where Luke begins to make clear the difficulty for the high priest and his associates because he points out that their party was the party of the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, of course, didn't believe in the resurrection. See, it would be bad enough to be a Pharisee and have condemned Jesus and then have it preached in Jerusalem that God had raised him from the dead. That would be bad enough because you were responsible for his execution, but At least you believed in the resurrection. And yet here, the high priest and his associates, those who were actually at the very top of this religious and political pyramid, they were Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection. And so this false Christ that had come forth was also, in their judgment now, coupled, linked inseparably to this false doctrine of the resurrection. And it was being preached in such a way that the resurrection was the proof of his messiahship, almost an intolerable frustrating 
situation. And then Luke adds one other thing here. He says they were jealous. It's interesting, isn't it? You see, if you can oppose Jesus on the basis of his being a false prophet, you can at least do that with a certain amount of nobility. I mean, truth is truth, falsehood is falsehood, we are defenders of the truth, sad as it may be, he must be opposed. You can sort of take the high road in that kind of an argument. And as far as the resurrection goes, you can take a biblical road. You can examine the text and you can say, we are convinced, we are the scribe, we are the learned ones, we are convinced that there's no such thing taught in the Bible as the resurrection. He is wrong. You can do that. But you see, what Luke tells us here is that that kind of argument seldom is really on that level. Usually there's something else beneath it, something festering away underneath. And in their case, it was jealousy. Jealousy of whom, I wonder? Were they jealous of Jesus? How could they be? Jesus was dead. Were they jealous of the apostles, these men who had no education? Yes, probably. And why? Because they were preaching powerfully. They were doing miracles. People were following them. And, you see, that's what the religious leaders wanted. I'm afraid that a lot of what happens in the world happens as a result of jealousy. It's not given that name. But often, often, especially when attacks are made on those who are being used of the Lord, it's jealousy that lies behind it, people that just resent the fact that someone else is getting the attention. At any rate, that's what was happening here. So now they began to move again. First time they had called them in, they had made threats. They said, now on our authority, we tell you, don't do this anymore. And they were out doing it again. So now they arrest them again, they bring them in, and, you know, that kind of procedure eventually leads to an attempt to kill the people you don't like. You see, if it's a matter of truth contending with falsehood, that's an open and free encounter. But that isn't what was going on here. This is hatred of these men for who they are and the success they're getting. And so, because they can't contend with them on the level of the truth, truth versus falsehood, they resort to the authority that they consider to be invested in themselves. We say on our authority, don't do it. And if you do it, we're going to arrest you. And if you still persist in doing it, we're going to have you executed. And of course, that's what happens, as we see in the next chapter. They arrest Stephen. Stephen gives his great speech in chapter 7, and then at the end of that chapter, Stephen becomes the first martyr. They kill him, you see. And even in this chapter, we read later on that they're furious at the apostles and want to put them to death. Now, if you're angry about something, especially in the area of religion, it's generally a sign that you're on the wrong track. There is a certain kind of righteous anger, the Lord had that kind of anger against those who were keeping people from the truth, who were setting up barriers, who were making merchandise of spiritual things. There is a certain kind of righteous anger. That's why I say generally anger shows that we're on the wrong track. It's not always the case, but generally it is. You find yourself in your heart just fuming about something, angry that so-and-so is doing something. Generally, that's a sign that something's wrong, and it certainly was in this case. Well, they brought them in. They had to do it carefully because they were so popular and they were afraid. It's interesting. It says in verse 26, they brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. You see, they wanted to do away with the apostles. They were afraid the people would try to do away with them. It shows the level on which they were operating. But they brought them in. They put them in jail. They thought they could bind them. They bound them. They could bind the word. They could keep the message from getting out. And, you know, there's a great lesson there. Binding the messengers never binds the message. You see, it says that in Scripture, that the word of God is not bound. Nothing physical can bind the message of the gospel. But they tried. The interesting thing is that in this situation, they didn't even succeed in binding the messengers because they put them in jail overnight. The next day when they were ready To proceed with their trial, they sent the captain of the guard down to bring them out of the jail, and when they went there, no apostles. They were gone. We're told by Luke what happened. God had sent his angel in the night, and he brought them out. Unlike the later experience, when Peter was delivered, the locks didn't even fall off, and the doors fly open. Somehow he brought them out and allowed all the doors to still be locked. 
And they came in the morning, they unlocked it, and no apostles. And they had to go back, I suppose, with even greater frustration than certainly with a large measure of chagrin. They had to report they just weren't there. And you know the funny thing, I guess Luke regards it as funny, at least it seems so to me. They're standing around there in their council chamber, having sent for the apostles and having it reported that they weren't there, and they're saying to themselves, where in the world are we? How are we going to find them now? They got away, and someone comes in the middle of their debate and says, it's not hard to find them. They're back out there in the temple area again preaching, same place they were the last time you tried to arrest them. And so they went out, they got them again, and they brought them in. And then they began to make their accusation, and their accusation has gone now a step further. It's very interesting. They accuse them, first of all, verse 28, of disobeying their orders. That's an appeal to simple authority. It doesn't make any difference whether they're right or wrong. They simply said, we told you not to do it, and you're doing it. So they're resorting to mere force, abstract authority, apart from the matter of right or wrong. That's the first thing. But it goes further than that this time, because now they say, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. That's very interesting because at the time of the trial of Jesus Christ, those are the very words they used. When Pilate said, will you crucify your king? They replied, let this man's blood be on our hands. And you see, now it was. And they're aghast at the consequences. You know, what they're expressing here is what is true of every single human soul. The blood of God himself is upon our hands because we, like these Jewish rulers, have set our face against the Lord and against his anointed. It's what sin is. It's a way of saying, we will not have this man to rule over us. Let's break their bands. Let's cast their fetters from us. Let's drive this Son of God out of our lives and drive him out for good. And what they did is just what people do today. Jesus isn't here, of course, to be physically mistreated, but that's what we do. It's exactly the same thing. And then we don't like it. We say, you're trying to make us guilty of this man's blood. Well, they were guilty. They didn't have to be made guilty. They were guilty, and they knew it. They knew it in the very way they were talking about this name, this name, this gospel. But you see, they didn't like it at all. Now Peter has a chance to give his next brief sermon. It's the next phase of this. You see the church unified and at peace, and then the persecution, and now Peter's response to this accusation of the leaders of the Sanhedrin. It's a great sermon. It really contains within it what is called in New Testament theological studies the kerygma. A number of years ago, a man in England whose name is C.H. Dodd published a book on the apostolic preaching in which he pointed out that every time you have it in Acts or little synopses of it in the letters later, it always follows the same kind of format. And he used the word kerygma to describe it. Kerygma means proclamation, and it meant a certain proclamation of basic facts, and that's what they're doing. The facts include the crucifixion. Paul does the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection, includes the exaltation of Jesus into heaven, is being seated at the right hand of God, and then finally the fact that we are witnesses of these things. And on the basis of what God has done in our witness, people are called to repent, receive forgiveness in his name. That was the basic Christian preaching. It raises an interesting question, though, doesn't it? Because what you say when you look at a summation of the gospel like this is where in this teaching is any reference to the great ethical teaching of Jesus Christ. You see, that is particularly noteworthy when you look at the Gospels, because if you study the Gospels for what Jesus Christ taught, mostly what the Lord Jesus taught was ethical teaching. Oh, he did it in the form of parables, he did it in the form of discourses, he did it in little exchanges with people, but mostly it had to do with how to live. Of course, he said he was going to die on the cross and all of that too, but mostly that's his teaching. And now you come to this early Christian preaching, and you find they're not talking about that at all. They're not quoting from the Sermon on the Mount. What they're preaching is the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, and forgiveness of sins by faith in his name. 
You say, what's going on here? Haven't they understood what Jesus Christ was teaching? The answer, of course, is that they had finally really understood it. What you find as you go on and you come to the epistles is that the ethical teaching comes back in at that point. You begin to find it applied to the churches and the Christian community. But what you have here in between, you see, is the basic evangel, and it's a way of saying graphically you must first come to Jesus Christ as Savior before you can have him as Lord over anything else. You see, you can't live the life of Jesus Christ. You cannot live out Christ's ethics unless you first of all have been forgiven of your sin. Matter of fact, unless you confess your sin and find forgiveness, you only go on into increasing sin, which is exactly what the leaders did. See, unconfessed sin destroys a life, and that's the pattern of human life. That's what people are like. They don't confess their sin. They don't come to God for forgiveness for their sin and cleansing. So they go on in a pattern of self-justification, and the evil multiplies, and they get harder and more and more angry and more and more stubborn and persistent and so on. It's the path of sin. It's what Paul describes in Romans. It's always downhill. The only way of finding salvation from that is to find forgiveness through Jesus Christ as the Savior, knowing that he died For you, that he bore the punishment of your sin, that you have forgiveness for what you've done, and therefore you can come and confess it freely. You can say to God, I have done wrong. That was awful. That was terrible. I should never have done that. It's a disgrace. It's an offense to you. It hurts other people. And find forgiveness. And that's the way a life is changed. You see, they didn't come before the Sanhedrin and preach the Sermon on the Mount. They didn't say to these Jewish leaders, these Sadducees, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. They weren't capable of doing that. What they said was, confess your sin, you're guilty of the crucifixion of the Son of God. Confess your sin and come to Him for forgiveness and cleansing. And of course, that's the gospel we preach today. That's what you have to do. Now, at this point, the disciples found an unexpected ally in This man, Gamaliel. Gamaliel is the one that the Apostle Paul had studied under in his earlier days. He was obviously a very great man. He was great as a rabbi, and he was great, as we would say, as a human being. As here you see, he had what is really very good worldly advice. He said, look, before you set out on a campaign to kill these men, because that's what they wanted to do, when Peter reminded them that they had been responsible for the death of Jesus of Nazareth, and it was unjust. They needed to repent of it. They didn't want to repent of it. They got hard in their hearts and angry. They were ready to kill them. That's what it says. They wanted to put them to death. Gamaliel said, now look, before you launch out upon that kind of course, just consider what you're doing. And consider this. Gamaliel was saying, in effect, I've lived a long time. I've seen a lot of things. And I have observed movements like this that have come in past years. There was this man, Thutis. He raised a little company, about 400 of them. He put himself forward as the Messiah, but he wasn't the Messiah, and it just ended up being nothing. He was defeated, and that was the end of it. And there was another man, Judas, same thing. I remember that story. He succeeded a little bit more than Thutis, but... uh, Eventually, that came to nothing, too. If these men are simply advancing a human doctrine, if this is just something of their own devising, it's going to come to nothing, too. But if it is true, if it's of God, then it will prosper. And if you launch yourself into opposition against them, you're going to find that you're fighting against God. Now, that, as I say, is really very wise advice. You see, he was just saying, let the thing run its course. Let time prove what the truth is. And yet, although I say that, and although I praise him as a wise and gracious, very understanding man, it did not go far enough. Because you see, there was this matter of guilt. There was this matter of complicity in the death of Jesus Christ. And what Gamaliel should have said is everything he did say, but he should have added this, and in the meantime, since we are so closely tied to this and are supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the nation, let's us investigate it and see whether it's true or not ourselves. And if it's nothing, 
then we'll let it go its course. But if it's true that Jesus really did rise from the dead, then our doctrine's wrong. The doctrine of we Sadducees, there is a resurrection. Our doctrine is wrong, and furthermore, our views of Jesus are wrong because that would be God's way of proving that he was the Son of God, and that his death on the cross really was a substitutionary sacrifice for sin, and he is the Savior, and he is the Messiah, and he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Let's investigate these things and see if they're true, but he didn't do that. And what happened, of course, you see, is the time did run its course, and this little religion, this little religion, Christianity, wasn't even called by that name in those days. It wasn't until later, and in a Gentile setting, that the Christians were called Christians. But this little religion did not fade away. It spread throughout the whole world. It grew in power and force, and it's come even to us today in America, land that wasn't even known at that time. And it's come in power and in great glory. You see, if you are on the side of the Sanhedrin, if you're on the side of the world, if you're saying, well, all kind of interesting, this religious business, but I certainly am not going to submit my life to Jesus of Nazareth, then let me say there is a stronger case today for the truth of Christianity than ever there was in the time of Gamaliel or the other Jewish leaders. What are you going to do with Jesus? You can't ignore him. His gospel is spreading all over the world. Everywhere you go, there are Christians that are bearing witness to his name. You can't ignore him. Are you going to fight him? How can you fight him when his gospel is so powerful? Will you not find yourself to be doing exactly what Gamaliel warned the Sanhedrin against doing? Find yourselves fighting against God? How can you fight against God and win? If you can't ignore him and you can't fight him, what else can you do? The only thing you can do is bow before him and confess your sin and seek forgiveness through his death. And find him to be, as so many millions have found him to be, gracious and loving, anxious to forgive and restore and bless and use you in a way which brings honor to God in his own name. Well, the Sanhedrin didn't do this. It says, verse 40, his speech persuaded them. That sounds like, well, all right, let's let them go. It half persuaded them, persuaded them not to kill them, but they beat them up anyway. And they sent them out, and instead of being depressed by the maltreatment, the apostles were told in verse 41, rejoiced because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Did I say earlier that there's nothing of the ethical teaching of Jesus Christ in these chapters? Well, not in the preaching, but it's there in the life, because this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is what Jesus had said early in the fifth chapter of Matthew's gospel as we have it. He said, rejoice when you're persecuted, because that's the way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And he could equally well have said, that is the way they are going to persecute me. You see, they stood for their master. They received the treatment he received, and some were eventually to die as he died. But they rejoiced, because it meant that their lives were joined with his life, and they were on the winning side in this great battle between good and evil, which is the story of human history. Let us pray. Oh, our Father, may it not be that any of us are found among that great number that unite themselves in opposition to God and his anointed. But rather, when we find ourselves among that company of the oppressed and persecuted, but faithful ones who count it joy to be thus identified with the one who gave himself for them. Amen. <laughs>
You're listening to the Bible Study Hour with the Bible teaching of Dr. James Boyce, a listener-supported ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. The Alliance exists to promote a biblical understanding and worldview, drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformed theologians from decades and even centuries gone by. We seek to provide Christian teaching that will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Alliance Broadcasting includes the Bible Study Hour with Dr. James Boyce, Every Last Word with Bible Teacher Dr. Philip Ryken, God's Living Word with Pastor the Rev. Richard Phillips, and Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, featuring Donald Barnhouse. For more information on the Alliance, including a free introductory package for first-time callers, or to make a contribution, please call toll-free. 1-800-488-1888. Again, that's 1-800-488-1888. You can also write the Alliance at Box 2000, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. Or you can visit us online at AllianceNet.org. For Canadian gifts, mail those to 237 Rouge Hills Drive, Scarborough, Ontario, m one c 2Y9. Ask for your free resource catalog featuring books, audio, commentaries, booklets, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians. Thank you again for your continued support and for listening to the Bible Study Hour.